Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, can I just ask you to keep your mics on mute? If you do want to ask a question or anything, please pop it into the chat box or sort of wave frantically at us so one of us spots you um, just to ask a question. We've got Alex with us tonight. And if you've been with us before, you will know that we like to chat and especially about stuff that we're passionate about. Um, and Spaniels is a massive thing to us. So, and Alex, I would have to say, is probably similar to us. Um, so we've potentially got three of us that are quite passionate about Spaniels. So we're going to try and rein it in tonight and keep it quite, um, quite sort of precise. But you know what we're like, so just bear with us and stuff and things like that. Um, I'm Jolene I'm Carter from Carter's Pet Services. A little bit about me. I've worked with dogs, running my own pet care company for about 17 years now. I've done scent work detection um, and man trailing for about five years now, four years, and been an instructor with man trailing um, UK or global um, now, as I know, for three and a bit years now. I started off with German Shepherds, um, who's quirky. And I've gone to the dark side about three years ago with Spaniels and they've evolved like gremlins um, once a year for the last three years. So now I've got three of the buggers, uh, excuse my French. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, Catherine? Hello, excuse the videos, bandwidth is crap. Hi, I'm Catherine Jones. I've been man trailing for about four and a half years. Um, my background is as a specialist behaviourist in aggression cases. Um, I was previously a security dog handler, security dog trainer, and um, used to train handlers as well. Um, and I am a self-confessed spaniel addict. I think they're just amazing, and I love them. Um, I also have three Springer Spaniels, couple which trail... Um, kind of why me trailing on really well and, and trailing spaniels are born um, I also have a couple of German shepherds my, my sin as well because you know why not um, so yeah I absolutely love spaniels. I think it's really important that we have a little different work because they're genetics which is why we're so excited to have Alex speak to us tonight because she is the um well we're going to call her the spaniel key queen she might not call herself that but she's certainly the spaniel queen and to talk to us about how spaniels work and give us a bit more of an insight into the spaniel so without further ado Alex if you'll mute yourself and introduce yourself hi everybody Lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Alex. My full name is Alexandra Borowska, in case you see my posts here and there on Facebook or anywhere. Um, uh, <laughs> Spaniel Queen, I'm not sure about, but I do certainly specialize in uh, Spaniels and helping Spaniel owners um, and other owners of dogs of working breeds, but in particular Spaniels, navigate life towards... I wouldn't say bliss. I would say probably more a life full of adventure and fun and satisfaction for both ends of the lead. Uh, my background is in uh, training all breeds and a whole variety of behavior issues um, because of my previous work before I had my own business um, where I just had to... Uh, show up and help uh, the owners with any kind of dog, any breed, any age, uh, whatever the uh, problem was. And this was um, kind of a jack of all trades situation. And I found that actually uh, digging really deep into a more particular topic, maybe something I'm actually passionate about, makes me a better trainer and helps me serve people better. So I went down that same path as I think many of us here have gone uh, into the Spaniel uh, rabbit hole. And I expect I'm gonna probably stay there. I've got two Spaniels in my life only. This is, called, this is going to be changing as uh, Jolene predicts about once one a year. I do have another secret love which interrupts the number of spaniels that joined my gang and that's staffies but it's a secret love and i don't talk about staffies it's a secret we don't talk about staffies this is this is just joking i love staffies and i talk about staffies but spaniels are my my the special thing and i study spaniels 
and I go deep into them and I learn everything I can about them. I continuously learn. I've been specializing in Spaniels for about four years now, five years, for about five years now. And I've been training dogs for almost 12 years. Um, there are six dogs in my gang and it includes two staffies and two Spaniels. So uh, my uh, business is called Synchro Dog Training. And you can find me on um, uh, Facebook. You can find me on TikTok and Instagram. And towards the end, I will share with you what my page looks like. So you can come and say hello and see what weird and wonderful things I post in there. Um, anything else that I have not? Oh, yeah. One, one thing I wanted to mention as well, guys, is the thing that made me learn the most about Spaniels, apart from studying their history and um interacting with loads and loads and loads of different spaniels is uh gun dog training and uh working uh, gun dogs in the field because that's where i was able to really deeply see what the little quirks that we notice repeat throughout the different kind of lines of spaniels what they are there for and how they are actually functional even if in everyday pet life they might not be they might make little sense it all starts to make sense when you when you watch dogs in their kind of natural habitat right and so i will be telling you a little bit about that later and okay. Alex, just as well, just to sort of clarify too, um, you were also um, a man training oh, yeah. instructor and you use some parts of this to as man training specifically to help sort of rehabilitate and give jobs something to do, don't you, as well? So yeah, it's I not forgot, just... Uh... I forgot to say, I was one of the um, uh, uh, man training globals uh, first wave of instructors and mm -hmm. I was an instructor from 2018 and uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm still an instructor however I've not actually been doing a whole lot of man training more re recently because I got so sucked into the very spaniel specific world but I did this for a um, good few years probably about four or five years and uh, that's how we met, Jolene, isn't it? We met through man trailing. And, yeah. uh, and so um, it used to be an activity I did with a lot of my uh, clients. I still use it with clients uh, who have certain specific problems or with dogs who, when we're exploring different things that the dogs might enjoy doing. So when I have a, a dog that's maybe um a, a, could be a spaniel or might not be a spaniel, and we're trying to figure out that dog's motivation and we can't find what the dog likes, very often man trailing ends up being the answer. Also, um, building confidence and building the dog's ability to cope with their environment. Uh, man trailing is a companion to a behavior modification program, a fantastic companion to a, to um. To, to that to that project of building dogs up and what's quite fascinating as well that obviously we've don't donned you the the spaniel queen we're obviously looking at doing man trailing as well so it's perfect because you know what we were doing you'll know what we're out there doing and stuff like that instead of speaking to just a gun dog person who potentially doesn't know what man trailing is about because then we get real bad crossovers with people not understanding really I think so yeah hopefully tonight's going to be awesome because you um know exactly what we're doing and you should be able to give us loads of pointers to help um Alex if we can dive in then let's have a look at going back to base um and talking about spaniels um and how they evolved and sort of the original roles and tasks can we go through that with you Yes, of course. Just before we go on, guys, uh, um, if you have a question or if you have a story that you want to share or a comment, please drop it in the comments. Some of the questions, if they're urgent, we're going to I'm going to answer on the on the run. Um, <clears throat> any questions that can wait, we will look at at the end. OK, so join in and join in the conversation in the comment box. So uh, in order to understand Spaniels, and what makes them good at trailing and what where their weaknesses are in following a, a scent trail. It's really good to uh, go 
into that natural habitat, go to their traditional historical roles and have a look at what they were bred to do exactly. What were the things that they were uh, supposed to do? And of course, that role can vary between the different types of spaniels as well. But we're going to just look at uh, kind of globally at spaniels job. The Gun Dog Club, which is a British organization um, that kind of helps uh, gun dog uh, owners uh, train their own dogs, has this interesting um, role um, title for Spaniels, and it's called Hunting Retriever. So the Gun Dog Club classifies three different, actually there's four, uh, groups of gun dogs, um, as everybody else, all the other organizations do, there is the setters and uh, kind of British pointers, the uh, English pointer, right? There is the HPR, so the European versatile dogs, the hunt point retrieve dogs. There is the retriever, the specialists who 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 whose main talent is retrieving. And then there is the dogs who hunt and flush and who also retrieve. And that's our hunting retrievers. And that basically means spaniels. <clears throat> so in those two words, we have a very good description of what um, what the, what spaniels are actually need to do. And in the field, of course, that role, the, the spaniels role would have changed through centuries. And, uh, and way back in the past, they weren't really um, breeds as such. Our spaniels weren't really spaniels. It was kind of a who knows really, but they were kind of something between a setter and a spaniel and they were quite closely related and they did all kinds of things. Uh, later as the as the um, uh, hunting purposes changed, they were working with, uh, with birds of prey. Uh, they were working to, later to the gun. That's where the kind of more modern look and function of spaniels comes from, is working to the gun. Uh, this uh, explains why spaniels are generally supposed to work no further than the gun would shoot, right? So they, they tend to, they are expected to work closely with the handler which is different to retrievers and HPRs and the setters and pointers, right? So spaniels work quite closely. The other thing that they do is their job is to move through the area together with the handler. Originally, this was a person with a gun and in front of the handler and not very far forward, like we noticed, it's got to be um, a range that's that fa that's not so far that if a bird flushes forward away from you, the person with the gun, that you won't be able to shoot it because then this would make no sense. So the spaniel has to stay close and in front of you and to the sides, they, they um, check if there is any birds. Let's just call it check because it's not just sniffing. It's not just scent. It's just also just thrashing through things it's trying to get the birds any birds that might be hiding there to freak out and go up also uh, so that you can shoot them because if they're hidden in the cover you can't shoot them uh, also um, there is a different way of using spaniels uh, in a beating line out on a shoot you may have a group of beaters and uh, they're lined up side to side, a little bit of um, <clears throat> distance between them. Each, each one of them has a spaniel or two. And uh, the spaniels are thrashing through the vegetation, making a lot of noise. The beaters are making a lot of noise, making weird calls and, and beating on trees and bushes. And what this does is it makes the birds hear the beaters from afar and already leave the area. And we're just trying to make the birds go in a particular direction. So the birds can uh, already hear you from about you know, 100 meters, 50 meters. They get up and they scoot off, scoot off towards the safety, towards sa where they think it's safety. But eventually the dogs will get there and will push them up. And Spaniels aren't supposed to be catching birds live birds uh, with one caveat and we'll get to that in a minute um they're supposed to be um flushing getting rid of any birds that are that are in the area by either getting them to move forward 
or to go up, right? So that's the role of a spaniel. Then uh, the next thing that would happen is the bird, some of the birds get shot. Only a small number of the birds get shot. About 20 to 30% of the birds get shot. So uh, many of them just fly off. Uh, but spaniels have just as much fun um, making them fly off as uh, as when the bird gets shot and then drops to the ground. The spaniel's job then is to find where that bird dropped locate that bird, uh, pick it up and bring it back, okay? This is where a lot of the funny, quirky behaviors with spaniels also come from. Like, I don't know guys, um, uh, if your dogs uh, bring you um, slippers or their toys or a blanket when you come home, then that's uh, related to that retrieving uh, distance, uh, retrieving um, thing in their genetics. Do they do they steal stuff? Do they like T-towels and socks if they do or, or spin remote controls? If they do, then that relates to that retrieving role that they've been uh, selectively bred to love, love carrying something in their mouth. And in order to be able to fulfill a task where you're carrying this bird that's probably similar size to you, uh, heavy, large, hard to grasp, Feathery, which is un unpleasant in your mouth, smells weird, and is very unbalanced. There's like wings, maybe over your head, and and like heads and and legs. Uh, in order to pick this thing up, and to confidently carry it back to your handler, and your handler might be over a river, up a muddy bank through um uh, vegeta through brambles through thick brambles that little dog has to not only have a love of carrying stuff in their mouth and the desire to be admired by you when they bring it towards you but also they have to be very persistent and they have to be very very driven they have to be very stubborn about what they believe they should be doing right and spaniels are very persistent very very single-minded about stuff and this is what sometimes makes it um like we can have arguments with our spaniels about what they're supposed to do versus what they believe they're supposed to do and uh yeah so that's one little quirk so uh so that's some of the kind of uh me that like the brief uh, broad description not brief broad description um now, where a spaniel's nose comes in is in uh, all of those roles. One is the hunting. Apart from just thrashing everything around you, like going into the bushes and shaking the bushes, literally, with their body, uh, they actually also use their noses to find the birds. And when they can smell a bird, they get very excited and you can see the little tail go absolutely nuts. That's because they're on scent and they're very excited and they want to locate that bird and make that bird move or make that, that bird go up. So that's one bit of scent uh, bit, um, uh, work that, dog, that Spaniels do. The other one is when that uh, bird is shot and it lands, the dog has to go out use their memory, use their spatial perception, the depth of the depth of field perception, and use their experience to try to get to that spot where they believe the bird fell, and then start searching that area and not leave that area until they find where that bird is. Okay, there could be a larger bird like a pheasant, it could be a small bird like woodcock, and sometimes it's quite hard to locate a bird like this. But the Spaniel is supposed to be persistent and continuing to f search for it until it finds that bird. Okay, that's another job. That's another nose job that Spaniels do. Another very interesting and very relevant to you guys job that uh, Spaniels do is sometimes, unfortunately, the bird, when it's shot in the sky, it's not yet dead as it lands. Many times uh, the, the bird is immediately dies in the sky and uh, already lands dead or is dead within seconds. But sometimes the bird is injured and not quite dead, but it's so injured that it needs to be put out of its misery because it's not gonna survive. So the bird will land and in an attempt to escape, it will get up and run off somewhere. To some usually into some bushes or some edges. 
right? And leaves a scent trail. So here, uh, the spaniel's job is to locate that area where that bird landed. And then there is no bird there, but the spaniel has to pick up the trail and then follow that trail all the way to where that bird is by now, perhaps dead or maybe still alive. And that is the one time where spaniels are allowed to catch live birds is when the bird is injured and cannot fly away because it's too injured to be able to escape. And the spaniel then brings you a live bird uh, that you then have to unfortunately dispatch. So this is what the trailing job for spaniels looks like originally. And when you look at um, the differences between the trail or man trailing trail and a pheasant trail, there, it's important to notice the differences. And also it's important to think about the hunting that Spaniels do versus the job that they do on the trail. Um, when a bird falls down from the sky, it's going to make a big scent patch where it lands, big, strong scent patch. There's gonna be some feathers sometimes as well because it's, because it's a few kilograms that uh, maybe two kilograms, I can't remember, but maybe it's not that much. Uh, anyway, some weight of a pheasant or a small bird that just smashed into the ground, right? And there is a patch of scent. Then that bird, it's probably, there's probably some blood as well. Then the bird will get up and move. And pheasants are um, much lighter than humans, all right? So they're gonna leave a lot less disturbance scent. When we humans move through grass, for example, or vegetation, we break vegetation, we squish the mud, we we um, crush little things along the way and we create, we, uh, we release fresh scent from where we walked, which together with our, the scent from our skin and the scent we actually, our individual scent we leave behind creates the trail, a fresh trail, right? Now, uh, the, the pheasants are going to leave some of their own scent, of course, but they're so light that they're not going to leave a whole lot of disturbance. OK, does this make sense? So um, that means that trail might not be so easy to find uh, from just disturbance. However, uh, typically places where a pheasant falls from the sky are going to be fresh. Uh, not contaminated by other disturbance unless a you know a whole um herd of herd flock of deer herd <laughs> out there. Herd yeah. of deer, uh, stampeded through the area then there is of course disturbance or there's other things creating fresh disturbance creating fresh you know walking around stamping around um noise olfactory noise in the area in the environment right so that means that um pheasant trails are much lighter in disturbance the scent that they leave i don't know if they leave more or less than what humans leave i have no idea how many you know what what the actual pheasant olfactory particles look like uh, in comparison to those of humans but pheasants are much smaller right um they this the trails are much shorter than what we prepare our dogs to follow they'll be like up to 50 meters right up to 60 meters right so actual air scent is, is also available quite close you know the scent uh, from the that, that emanates from the pheasant that's hidden there is little disturbance usually there is not a lot of contamination uh, there will be some contamination from other wildlife, but there isn't all this olfactory noise of lots of people having gone through the area and disturbed things, okay? So that's some of the differences in the trail with a pheasant. Uh, uh, now let's quickly look at the hunting so we can visualize what uh, makes spaniels so impatient when they're using their nose and they're hunting. When spaniels are working, and they're doing this side to side, this quartering, right? Trying to get the birds uh, that are in the area to either go up or move. They're looking for a large scent uh, thing, large scent uh, picture. They're looking for something big. Pheasants are big and birds are big smelly things, right? In comparison to human uh, cells, 
human skin cells, you know, the flakes, the skin flakes and other tiny, um, um, other tiny bits of scent that dogs look on the prey. Say again, sorry. Okay. I carry on that. Uh, so there is, there is, <laughs> the, the, when the dogs, when our trailing dogs are on trail, they're for, following tiny amount of scent, right? Our, uh, my, our uh, spaniels, they're just running around scanning for a possibility of a bird scent getting stronger or just detecting any bird scent and they want to run into where they believe there is more of that bird scent, right? And birds are big and smelly, right? In comparison to remains of human, um, not human remains, just what's left after a person has gone past. So, so Spaniels are used to finding something just by moving their legs very fast. Because if they go, if they run around side to side, they're going to run into a scent, um, some sort of a scent picture. They're going to run into some bird, some smelly bird eventually, right? Whereas that does that um, strategy doesn't work on a trail. But that's why you sometimes see when for when spaniels are aroused, but maybe either not confident or not experienced, they will solve that problem of I don't know, I don't know, by just running. And they just scan. They're just trying to scan for uh, for the scent. But if it's a tiny amount of scent, running around isn't a good strategy. Okay. So um, what else is different in hunting? Running is an important part in hunting. Just using, if your nose is switched on, your legs are also switched on. Typical issue with lead walking. Most of my clients, one of the typical problems that they come to me, my pet dog, Spaniel owners, is can I just, can, my, can you help me teach my dog to just stop pulling like a train on a lead because it's because it's because it's tiring to both of us and neither of us are having fun and i and i help them with this but it's an important thing to understand that when excitement is up in a spaniel they want to be using their legs or that's actually the same for every dog for most dogs but also if you allow your dog to to sniff and your dog isn't yet able to sniff and walk calmly it's a scale for a spaniel then chances are if they find something that smells good and interesting they can't help it their legs go <laughs> and the ears go uh, the ears switch off the legs switch on and that's how spaniels basically operate then we have to t we have to kind of re reprogram that slightly to help it like to ch develop a new skill uh, and so these are some of the typical spaniel kind of talents uh, and the thing they were bred to do I'm just going to quickly check um, that I've covered everything. Guys, Catherine and Jolene, have I, what does this sound like to you? Oh, you're, you're uh, muted, my, my love. It's amazing. Hello. I'm loving it. I'm sitting here, my little brain's falling apart going, oh yeah, of course, that makes loads of sense. Um, <laughs> so it's, um, Really, really good. A couple of people put in the comments. I could listen to you for hours, Alex, which is oh, absolutely right. <laughs> so lovely because I love talking. I love talking about Spanish. <laughs> we'll see if they still feel the same two hours in. <laughs> yeah. Not. They'll be nodding off. <laughs> I'll still um, be sitting at the camera with excitement, but uh, yeah, people will believe Yeah. It. Someone's asked, um, it, you mentioned um, the term olfactory noise. And they've asked, is that is that contamination? Not necessarily. So olfactory noise basically means other scents that are present that um, our uh, person, like imagine um, olfactory noise is like coming into a room and you're looking for a thing, one sing single thing. This is a vision. We're going to talk visual, right? We're going to make a visual comparison. You're looking for one small thing and you come into a room and it's empty or it only has big things in it, right? Big barrels and big boxes and you're looking for one small thing. And maybe your thing is different color, right? Different color. So you're gonna find it easily. 
uh, this is a level, this is a low level of visual noise, right? But imagine you come into a room looking for a small thing and the room is absolutely chock full of different small things of different colors even the the paper uh, the my horrendous um wallpaper uh, imagine like one that's even more noisy and you've got like so much visual noise everywhere that trying to locate your one small object that you're looking for is hard this is what i mean by olfactory noise you come into a place that has a lot of other smells in it right? Uh, this can be just um, the, pres the noise that's present in the environment. When we talk about contamination from a man trailing point of view, we're thinking about what has what else has been on this trail that will confuse the dog, right? So for example, if, if uh, the trail is contaminated, if other unnecessary things have been added to the trail, that aren't part of the natural uh, picture. For example, if somebody walks across, so you go out trailing and you're on, you, you've laid the beautiful trail and you think you've got control over your trail, impossible, especially if you're in public places. And then somebody walks right through your trail with two dogs and uh, just creates a fresh trail on top of your trail, right? That's contamination now. It's like, imagine contaminating um, a crime scene. Contamination on the crime scene isn't any part of what's already been and is part of the crime scene. It's what has been added unnecessarily. When, when the fire uh, um, uh, brigade came in and just like poured, uh, you know, the their foam. Now I'm talking out of my bomb hole because I don't know what I'm talking about. But, you know, they've like trampled everywhere and, and like destroyed all the a lot of the evidence that's contamination so the difference between noise that's naturally in the background and contamination is natural noise is just what is there and contamination it's what's been added uh that should that ideally wouldn't have been added okay so does that make sense cat just pop it in the group and just and if if it makes sense a little bit more to everyone else or it doesn't we can clarify it a little bit further on can't we so it's just um different terminology i think um so it's just good to clarify so that everyone understands so if we're talking about our spaniels um can we have a look at potentially looking at the qualities spaniels have to that makes them good at trailing our qualities for trailing yeah so there is things that they're obviously that things about spaniels that make them great for trailing and there are things that make them not so good for trailing so let's start with the good things <laughs> so the good things that make spaniels awesome mm -hmm. um for trailing is the fact that they are already interested in using their noses and using their noses is a big part of their kind of job description. They are born loving to use their noses. Of course, this varies between individuals and breeds, but generally they do love using their nose. So that's one thing. Um, uh, the other thing that's really, that makes them great for trailing is the fact that they're optimistic little creatures generally. They like solving problems they come into the world expecting that of course again this varies between individuals there are of course pessimistic spaniels out there but generally they're little little um happy go lucky little uh, critters who come in and expect that things will work out fine for them so they're they're quite happy to go and try new things they are uh, generally quite um interested in novelty rather than worried about it so when we compare uh, two breeds and this is Catherine and Jolene this is interesting because these are uh, this is a breed that both of you have german shepherds <laughs> and other uh, uh uh, stock uh, herding dogs also stock guardian breeds they uh, the, the pastoral breeds one of their qualities is to be suspicious and to be scanning constantly either looking for something new and early detection of danger threat 
or changes that might need to be addressed or for dogs, our popular and phenomenal breed, Border Collie, it's the fact that Border Collies are looking at others constantly, checking for minute changes in body language because the Border Collie wants to read the intention of every sheep in its stock so that the Collie can be already in position before that sheep makes any move, right? So we're talking about dogs who are constantly vigilant right? And the German shepherds are a bit like this. They're constantly looking. They're, they're very aware of their surroundings. They're very clever at reading the room and knowing what's uh, like, not having a good measure of everyone in the room, right? And border collies are similar. They're very visual uh, dogs as well, where spaniels ha don't need to have that quality, right? Spaniels aren't supposed to try to read what others are doing. They're supposed to focus on their task and to persist at it. And their task involves speed and power and using their nose, right? So spaniels come into the world and they don't go, they generally, right? Again, individual differences, but they generally don't go looking for what could go wrong or what in their environment might need, you know, um, addressing, Okay, so that makes them actually great at trailing because they don't get quite so uh, dis distracted by things that might be perceived threats, by things that are, you know, that are part of the environment, right? Visual environment. Once they're on their task and on their trail, they want to stick to it. Of course, uh, olfactory um, interests can become uh, this, uh, um, distractions, but that's quite different, okay? So they're optim generally optimistic. They're quite people-friendly, generally. They might not be um, wanting to say hello, but they, they aren't, there isn't, a, when we compare the number of stranger danger uh, worries in uh, German Shepherds and um, Border Collies versus in Spaniels, I don't get, as a Spaniel expert, I don't often come across people who tell me my main problem is that my dog is worried about people. I get this, I do get dogs like this, but it's definitely not the most common, where it's a very common one with collies, shepherds, and certain other breeds, okay? So, uh, Spaniel- Can I, can I just ask, um, yeah. I've got a Labrador across Malinois I've gained, like, what am I gonna do with that man trailing? Because it's, it's half Malinois, mostly and then some labrador with shepherd in do you think i'm going to get stranger danger or focus at the moment it switches between the two you see the labrador walk in and then you see the malinois walk in interesting um, uh, this just will depend on which genes get expressed which mm. genes are there which uh bits of genetics um uh which the which traits your dog has inherited breed wise and also the parents if you know the parents that would be uh, that would be a good source of information the other bit is which of those genes get expressed because when when we're talking and we're thinking about genetics and genes mm. everything is on a not everything but most things are on a scale so you don't get one uh, gene that means your dog will definitely be like this will be excellent at hunting for example right you get a dog who has a potential to be excellent at hunting. And if you, and uh, uh, there's a scale of potential, right? Or you have a dog who has a gene potentially for stranger danger. And if things, if you uh, don't want stranger danger and you work with that dog, you will get the minimum of that scale expressed. You will get that, that potential for stranger danger will be minimized. It will still be there because your dog has a has a tendency. That dog has is born with a tendency towards stranger danger, but you can minimize it or you can enhance it. Right. So that's mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting thing. And when we have mixes, it's we never really know which traits. So we have a Mali Labrador mix. We don't know is that dog gonna love retrieving or is that gonna love dog love biting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it just wants to do all of the above as fast as possible with my slippers um but that's really interesting really because that's genetic expression um because people go oh well 
I grew up with a spaniel, sorry, my video's crap. Um, I grew up with a spaniel and it was like this or it was like that. And you're like, yeah, okay, it was a springer, but your springer's not the same right now. It's it's different. Um, and it, it's important that people understand or work with what they've got in order to produce a version of them that might work best for them as opposed to the most manic spaniel in the room. Yeah, Depending and even within breeds, there is differences, massive mm. differences. So, yeah. Um, I'm very curious to know, Catherine, how your dog develops and um, which of the talents. Yeah. Uh, so am I. At the moment, it's uh, it's Labrador when things are quiet and it just mooches about. And then all of a sudden you see it go, mama, and it goes across the room. And then it ticks back into being a Labrador. I've never had a dog switch between the breeds so much as a pup. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, a Spaniel's much easier than whatever this thing's going to be. Um, I don't, I don't know what it's going to be, um, but I want it for man trailing. So we'll, yeah. we'll see what I nose work is what we're going to push at the moment to bring it in, which is why I'm interested in stuff you're going to be on about. Cause I want to get this puffy just right. Yeah. I have some tips for you because Labradors again, there are even that's they're they're different still from Spaniels. So uh, Labrador's role is different to that of Spaniels to a large degree. And Labradors do less nose to the ground work. They do a lot more air scenting naturally in their jobs than they do a nose to the ground kind of work. So um, that means you have, I would be, if I had a lab um, or lab cross for trailing, I would be early on building uh, interest in scent on the ground and close to the ground and building that, like, that expectation. Uh, so um, more good things about Spaniels that make them super cool for trailing is that they are um, waterproof. They're waterproof. They don't care. They are weatherproof. They're rugged. They're built for weather. So having a Spaniel means, unfortunately, for those of us who are um, uh, fair weather people I don't like rain and I don't like wind uh, when well, I don't mind wind but I don't like rain and wind and I hate mud and um, so that makes me uh, that my spaniels force me to go out but now that we have a good reason to go out uh, a lot of really fun training and uh, kind of beating happens in winter I'm actually starting to kind of get over myself a little bit with the weather Proofness. But my spaniels, I'm more like a staffy when it comes to weather. And I like wear a million, like like I have oh I overdo umbrellas and coats because I'm just like, Ugh. uh so uh yeah, so spaniels don't care. But no matter what conditions, they will happily go out there and work, right? So that makes them very good. So these are the qualities that make them super good. Shall we look at the have you guys got any comments to add? On us, on what makes spaniels awesome for trailing, in your so experience. If we just do a quick bullet point of the ones that we've just gone through, only purely to run over them again. So we like to say that they were scent focused breed. Yep, generally people friendly and quite optimistic yep. when we're talking about sort of a large quantity. Highly trainable. Yeah, and easy to read. Oh yeah. Of time. Yeah. Yep. Easily to reward. Yep. Reward, yeah, sorry. Um, and then sort of rugged and not really affected by the weather. Yeah. I just wanted to retouch on those only because we had the Labby Mally bit in the middle. So I wanted to make sure that people got it. Good. Cool. Okay. Uh, oh, there was one more. Um, that persistence that they have. The fact mm. that they, once they, uh, there is another thing about Spaniels. They, while they love people, right? They are quite social with people and they love being admired and approved of and worshipped by people. They are actually, they don't think very highly of our abilities. They have, uh, they are a little bit, um, they think they know better, basically. That's Spaniels, right? Where our Border Collies and Shepherds are a little bit more kind of, they they don't uh, question us quite as much, right? Whereas our Spaniels are, they know better and they don't think highly of what we have to contribute when it comes to nose jobs, right? So when a Spaniel is uh, engaged in work, in nose work, they will trust their own instincts rather than 
us and our ideas of where things might be, right? They hear us and they're just like, yeah, I hear you, but uh, sorry, you're actually interrupting me right now. And this makes them, Spaniels, really good at um, really forgiving to work when uh, when the handler is not experienced. So when the handler is working a trail that's not blind, right? When the handler knows where the trail is, it's very hard for us handlers to not give our dogs cues about where the trail is. Very hard. The same in scent work and scent detection. When we're training dogs for scent detection and we know where the hide is, it's very hard for us. We make a, It's very hard to not make mistakes and subconsciously cue our dogs to where the, the scent is. And here is where Spaniels are good. They don't care. They do care. They can get clever about this, right? But generally, they know that they're better at this than you are. And they will just um, uh, stick to their job, right? And they will, uh, they will, you could be, you could be cueing them and you're not as likely to mess it up with a Spaniel as you would be with some other breeds that are very handler focused and checking what you're doing the whole time. Like your Border Collies and German Shepherds, you have to be very, and Malinois, you have to be very careful about making mistakes because they're very good at people watching. Where Spaniels are like, well, I don't care. You could be doing whatever you want. Just leave it to me. Stand over there. Let me get on with my work, right? That's your Spaniel. So that's another quality that makes it, them great. So that's five qualities that make them good, okay? Now, let's talk about things that are kind of weaknesses for Spaniels on the trail. Not so much weaknesses, but the things that are that don't work in their skill set, that don't work, work in their favor on the trail. And one of those we already touched on is that Spaniels really, really love to move their legs when they're when they're working, when they're on scent. They 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 run. And that's not always a great strategy on the trail. You want the dog who is kind of, um, you want, there are bits on the, tra there are parts of trails, especially when the trail is aged or contaminated, where the dog needs to be more thoughtful and more mindful. And so running is not um, the solution, but it's very hard to explain that to a Spaniel because for them, running is generally a solution to any problem. So this is something we need to, um, you know, help them with. Uh, another one is um and uh, another like with this when, what comes with this is the fact that when they're not only that when they're running they could be um leaving the trail and they end up doing this kind of back and forth thing uh, zigzagging on the trail often because they're they want they're wanting to be fast but they're not necessarily very thorough but also they can overshoot uh, turns and changes in the trail it because speed means they take in much fewer um breaths their sniffing rate might be good they might be sniffing every you know that many times per second but if they're moving through the area very fast and the scent is very thin on the ground they're gonna they will miss right so that's this bit. Oh, I just thought about another thing we haven't talked about. Uh, oh. just, uh, we are in qualities that go for Spaniels on the trail. Two physiological qualities, the way their Spaniels are built. Let's go back a second. Uh, rewind <laughs> to the qualities, pro trailing qualities for Spaniels. Two things that make them good for the trail in their build how they're put together. One, they're quite low to the ground. So they're, uh, they're, they are going to be, their nose is going to be quite often in the area where the trail uh, set, scent is. So the trail scent is depending on the weather conditions and a lot of other factors. The trail is gonna be on the ground and just off the ground a little bit, right? But Spaniel's nose is naturally gonna be in that area. That's really good. Another thing is floppy ears. Floppy ears, very often are associated with dog breeds that do something with their nose. Whereas pointy ears are often associated with dog breeds that need their ears, right? More than their nose necessarily. 
right? So um, our border collies are half pointy ears, shepherds and malinois have pointy ears because they have to be constantly, um, uh, you know, aware of their environment. And also they have to sometimes hear their handler miles and miles away, right? Spaniels don't have to have anything. Uh, they don't have anything built in for hearing their handlers. I'm only kidding, actually, Spaniels do. <laughs> gun dogs do need to they are very they, they that that's what makes gun dogs different from scent hounds gun dogs are very cooperative even if you don't feel today that your dog is being very cooperative spaniels in comparison to beagles for example or foxhounds are very cooperative and very willing to work with people whereas um the scent hounds are not okay so uh, uh but spaniels like uh scent hounds have floppy ears and the ears uh, have apparently an important role. The theory is, is that they create a little kind of a curtain around the nose that helps concentrate the scent particles. So the dog has a better chance of taking in, uh, of, of capturing the, the scent particles, right? Uh, where pointy-eared dogs don't have that. So that's uh, physiological, two physiological advantages for training dogs. Now, I, throughout uh, our chat, I may come up with more, but we're gonna be <laughs> uh, we're gonna be mo we're moving on to the weaknesses. So the weaknesses is they want to run, and uh, that makes them not very thorough. Um, uh, <clears throat> the other thing that makes it a little hard can make it a little hard for do for dogs for spaniels is that they are very interested in wildlife. So if there is um, hunty scents on the trail, um, for spaniels, it's very hard to ignore those, right? Because uh, birds and uh, squirrels uh, are generally um, important in a spaniel's life and feature highly on their list of things that are important in life. Birdies, squirrels, and uh, a lot of other critters, right? So if your trail is um, has a lot of wildlife in it, you might end up being uh, following your dog towards uh, some sort of a fox then, uh, rather than, uh, you know, your, your spaniel might switch the trail because there is a more interesting hot trail that's worth pursuing and you want you, you might even not know that if you're on a blind if you're you know following a blind trail so that's a uh, wildlife right uh, and the other thing about spaniels is they because they're um because of their job description historically and how they hunt and how they use their noses they are used to uh um high dopamine tasks they are used to uh, instant gratification so for example if they are following a trail and it's difficult and it's long and they come across a problem they might get frustrated by it right um <clears throat> and they have to be restrained and not uh, and not and have to con focus and concentrate for a long time and are not able to use their legs for speed purposes, they can get frustrated because spaniels in their natural habitat, when they hunt, they're hunting for a large thing that's very smelly, right? One, so birds. Two, they get to run and thrash things, which is fun for spaniels, very good fun. Uh, running into stuff and just running is good fun. When they can't be running and they have to uh, look for a very, very thin smell, that's not what their job description is about. And they can get frustrated. The same with other tasks. They can get frustrated healing for a long time. They can get frustrated with repetitive tasks. They can also get very frustrated if the trail is too easy. They don't like easy. It needs to be just the right level of challenge <laughs> for Spaniels to be, uh, you know, to feel happy. And all of this gets heightened in adolescence. So if you have a Spaniel between one and two and a half years old, chances are all the things that I mentioned are going to be heightened at this time of the year uh, of their life until they're more experienced and a little bit more, you know, together. So, um, so these are the things. Uh, so yeah, when they, when they, uh, so let's sum summarize the kind of the 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 things that aren't in their favor. One, they want to be running when uh when uh they, they want to be 
moving their legs. When there is scent, they want to be moving their legs, right? That's tricky. The same in scent detection. It depends what kind of scent detection you do with your dogs. But if you if your spaniel is supposed to find something very small, it can, they can get frustrated because they just want to run and hunt for something big. They want to run a lot. They want to do a lot of running and they don't like having to slow down. There's in scent detection, you might find come across spaniels who will find all the hides. If there is a room, for example, there's a scent detection task. Not We're not talking about, you know, highly trained detection dogs, but sport uh, scent uh, spaniels. They do, spaniels do it more than other breeds. They go into the room, they go and find all the hides. And instead of indicating on any of them, they just carry on running around right? Because they're having fun running. And maybe they're a little bit, a little bit nervous or a little bit excited and they don't want to stop running. They found, they're just not indicating because running around and sniffing is more rewarding than the reward you're going to give them for indicating on their, on their find. That's something that happens in scent detection with some spaniels. Okay. So, uh, running when excited, uh, uh, solving any problem with speed especially when they're frustrated so arousal and frustration both uh, tend to trigger there is typical problem solution response in a spaniel uh, speed a typical problem solution in a malinois is bite bite it uh, or bark at it if you uh, don't know what to do bite it or bark at it typical uh, problem uh, uh, solving thing where the spaniel is run around and uh, look busy that's what spaniels do, right? So that's what they will do on trail. Sometimes it's not actually running around and sniffing. It's a, it can be displacement behavior. They start just being busy, looking busy. They do, they're very good at looking busy. Um, then, uh, and sometimes that doesn't involve uh, using their nose at all, right? We actually have to teach them to use their nose and not necessarily always while uh, running, right? Can we actually use our nose and not run? We, we it's hard very hard for a <laughs> right okay uh, and uh, the other uh, thing that's uh, that's hard is the wildlife that's a major distraction for spaniels uh, especially the scents but for some spaniels the sight as well and movement and they get very easily frustrated spaniels do uh, unless you have unless they're really experienced experience and age helps spaniels deal with frustration better all young dogs of all breeds get frustrated easily, teenagers, but Spaniels uh, and some other breeds, of course, don't like repetitive tasks, don't like, um, like not necessarily all repetitive tasks, but tasks that are easy and repetitive, or if they, if, if the task is quite hard for them and they have to stay focused for a very long time, they don't, they, they want to switch to instinct rather than cognition. They want to switch back to the parts of their brain that, that just do things on autopilot because they enjoy that flow. The thinking thing, they leave it to border collies and German shepherds and that. <laughs> right, uh, so that's the typical problems, I think. I want, I'm curious to know, guys, um, what, um, how, what do you think? Let's take a little moment to have a look at maybe at the comments to see yeah. what... Um, what I think I can maybe see the comments just to see what uh, what people we've, think about those traits. We've got a few, um, so it'd be good to go back through them if we can. Just a few comments from people, um, about what we've talked about. So, uh, Marie with Hebe has said that her dog's incredibly opinionated, and her training has to take take that into account. Everything has to be made as if it was her idea. Then she will absolutely do or try oh, yeah. anything I ask. Yeah. Tony yeah. said that his dog kind of comes across quite cocky and a bit overconfident, really. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. Clara says that her Spocker, Sprocker sorry, regards her as the liability at the other end of the line and she yeah. frequently feels the same about him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this all sounds so familiar. Yeah. Tony said that he ran for about 18 months at full pelt while man-trailing and, yes, he overshot a lot. <laughs> I hope you're still not doing that, Tony. I hope you slowed down a bit. He is absolutely <laughs> dead slow and spot on, honestly. Very good. And okay. then Clara has said, um, yes, one of the things I need to work on more is dis discerning when he's on the actual trailer, when he's just spanieling, because there was a rabbit there two weeks ago. 
Yeah, Kira, uh, uh, this is an important, this is a very interesting, okay, sorry. I think this is, uh, this is a very, very typical thing in Spaniels, is trying to, to, to um, work, work, uh, look at your dog's body language and figure out what are they doing? Are they on scent? Are they circling because they need a poop? Or are they just faffing? And Spaniels do a lot of this faffing about either because sometimes it's a displacement behavior because they lost the trail and they just don't want to stop running. So they just carry on looking busy. Sometimes it's because they're, they found something else that's interesting and they've forgotten all about the trail because the trail wasn't that relevant to them. Do you know what I mean? Like our wildlife is one step, one um, whole um, oh, yeah, level. It's another, it's another level for him. Yeah. And what you said as well about sometimes they prefer a challenge. So if he's doing something like delayed start or a scent article start, he's much more motivated and less likely to spaniel than if we're just doing a bog standard intensity. Yeah. You know, so... And yeah, the learning to learning to read the tiny bits of his body language is so interesting. I agree. I think intensity, we'll talk about this in a moment. Intensity starts with Spaniels. Are, um, it's, it's not something I'd be doing a lot, if I'm honest. It depends, of course. And your instructor will know your dog and they will know whether they're um, whether your dog needs building up. Right. But generally, I would be with Spaniels, I'd be fading out intensity starts very quickly. And I'd be going from a scent article or even delayed starts. Uh, or sorry, the other way, delayed starts yeah. or scent article. Um, because he's very, he's very happy to hear that, by the way. <laughs> good. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> very good. OK, and then we've got uh, what else have we got, uh, Jolene? Uh, so sorry if I pronounce anything wrong. I'm on my phone, hence why I'm squinting. Um, Becky says, this all makes so much sense. I can see all the things when my Springer did her first trails la last week with Catherine. Mm, cool. Okay, so I'm glad, guys, that you are uh, finding this, uh, you know, with your with your own dogs, you're finding the same stuff. Um, Marie, Hebe, uh, she mentioned about Hebe and um, being opinionated. It's another thing that, you know, the, just the Spaniels just know better. And they just sometimes go like, they're like, they're just like uh, indulging us sometimes. They're like, like, you know, they roll their eyes. They look like they're just rolling their eyes. And um, they sometimes don't like being told what to do and it's like Marie's approach of trying to help uh, to make Hebe uh, discover that she came up with a particular idea makes it um, more likely that, that Hebe will actually do it and that's going to come into uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking now about the solutions okay to the things to those things that are not the strong not the not strength not spaniel strengths we're going to talk about uh, how like what are the little things you can do to help your spaniel outside of your man training and also as part of your man training so um so if you haven't got a pen and paper guys now would be the time to probably go and get it um yeah we let's give you guys said. a minute uh to grab to grab it shall we um just a couple of seconds we probably should have said it at the start i've just remembered to be honest but people might want to take this down or the recording will be in this man trailing spaniels group tomorrow so you could always re-watch it as well so alex is going to give you all guys all the answer to your spaniels so uh you've all been waiting for it you need to write this down <laughs> don't have a spaniel no do have a spaniel a spaniel will make your life better and be more spaniel. I've been messaging uh, Alex for years saying, can I post my Spaniel down to you? She's driving me mental. <laughs> yeah, anytime. And um, yeah, the thing with Spaniels is you, uh, and one of the reasons why I love working with Spaniel people, right? Why they are my favorite clients is that Spaniel, people who choose to have a Spaniel in their life have to have some kind of tolerance of chaos and have to have sense of humor. You can't live with a spaniel harmoniously and not just like pull your hair out without sense of humor, because they're just clowns and they will they will um, do things. They're not um, 
they're not very kind of aloof kind of you know um majestic creatures they are of course they're majestic very majestic but they're mostly just total clowns and they're cheeky and they're sassy and that's how we love them so uh, guys we're going to talk about um, some solutions for those traits to to improve um the the uh on those kind of weaknesses so um for wanting to run when aroused, so dogs who who are spaniels who are excited uh, or frustrated and they just want to run, right? Uh, that happens a lot on intensity trails. So this is uh, why I would be beyond the first beyond building the motivation for trailing, which is important, of course. I would be um, getting your spaniels into um delayed starts and into uh starts from articles as soon as possible i would just try to make the environment easier right so i would try to work maybe on not very contaminated ground maybe i would try to um make the trails quite simple but i would try to not use use the intensity starts too much with spaniels because it increases arousal and frustration, which is great for building motivation. It's fantastic for building motivation, but it also increases speed. And speed is not a quality we want to necessarily cultivate in our Spaniels because they're already got tons of that. So um, <clears throat> one thing I do with my Spaniels, and I do this with, um, with uh, I, I found that it really helps with my um, gun dog training, strangely enough, is that they uh they train scent detection they we we do scent detection for fun and uh, one of the things specific tasks in scent detection that can be very helpful in tracking or trailing is to teach your dog to search for a tiny tiny amount of scent so a very detailed search perhaps not of a very large area it might be a small area but for a minuscule amount of scent. And so working with Kong, for example, you know, those of you guys who are familiar with scent detection, you probably also know that uh, in some scent detection sports and forms of tra training, people use Kong. And uh, the red Kong, the red rubber Kong, just uh, cut into tiny pieces or different sized pieces. The good thing about using Kong or anything else like this that you can, you can uh, control the size of means that you can cut your Kong into such tiny pieces that you have to handle it with tweezers because you can't possibly pinch it with your fingers. And when you teach your dog to go through the steps in training with your Spaniel to the point where they search for these minuscule amounts of scent, your Spaniel learns to improve their scent, um, the rate of sniff, sniffing, and they improve that ability to follow a very, very small amount of scent. One uh, thing we do with scent detection is uh, to like the way we actually train this. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this because it's a big process. I can direct you to someone who who I would massively recommend. But um, we use these bricks or we use something else that has lots of little holes Um ideally holes that are quite deep where you can put your tiny little bit of Kong. So the scent is hard, a little harder to find. And we build a wall with these bricks. I have one here in the room, but I'm not gonna show you my room because it's very messy and that would that would be very embarrassing. Uh, we have these, we buy loads yes. of these bricks or similar bricks. We stack them up and we create this kind of wall uh, that's you know several levels high and as as wide as you can outside or out or inside, and you place your little bit of tiny tiny little bit of scent. It could uh, could also be another thing like if you're working with a different scent, say truffle oil for example, you could be or I don't know gun uh, gun oil or what uh, anything like this. You can uh, have a soak, so a small thing that's been soaked in the smell. But the problem is sometimes these soaks can be visible, easily easily visible. So you need to have something that's so small that the dog's isn't, dog isn't looking by their eyes. 
for they're not using their eyes to find it. So the hands again, Kong tends to work really well. Doesn't have to be Kong. I actually used um a different type of toy in the past. Um, just cut it into tiny pieces. It just needs to be uniform. And you put this in here. And as your dog gets better in a wall and the dog is searching a wall, as your dog gets better, you create another wall and you have now a double layered wall. Can you see? So these holes are now deeper. As quickly as you can, you do this. And now your dog has to check literally every hole, right? As they're searching because the scent is deep inside before they move on and it slows them down it stops them from running and it makes them send a sniff very with very high uh, intensity of sniff, very high sniffing rate uh, for those of you who are interested in this and you're interested in scent detection and you would like to learn more or even become instructors uh, there's loads of different cool courses out there there's scent instructors all over but a person who will help with this specific thing is astrid um with a company uh, called on target uh training on target on target canine isn't it canine. oh yes of course see i don't even know my my friend's uh business name but jolene does you you've worked with uh astrid haven't you um yeah. on target canine and uh, she does this kind of stuff so if you wanted to do this get in contact with on target canine and she will uh guide you through it um so this so that why I would call this search detailed search for a tiny amount of scent. Once your dog has done brick wall, you can transfer this onto the ground and you can put your tiny little piece of uh, Kong in gravel, in amongst gravel or in grass and just let your dog find this. And that will again, in, it, it, that will get them used to using their noses more than their legs. Okay, so that's one thing to help kind of slow them down and make them a little bit more thorough rather than just fast, right, and efficient. What um, are your thoughts, Alex, just before, before we move on, about somebody doing that with the scent of, like, so using food as your scent? Because obviously we all have access to food. Dogs are often quite motivated by food. What is your thought process about getting them to search for food more instead of... We can. The only thing is we want them to, when our goal is to set, is to get the dogs to, to use their nose more than their legs, the amount of food would have to be absolutely tiny. Does this make sense? Yeah, because of the odor. Because of the odor. We want it to smell the scent to be so small this is one particular exercise in detection. You can do all kinds of exercises. I absolutely 100% agree that to get your dog to, to use their nose more, just scatter, if you use kibble, just scatter it on the grass every day and your dog will quickly learn that, uh, you know, to use their nose. And there is a certain amount of fitness required for a tracking or trailing dog or a detection dog. And that fitness isn't just general fitness that, that they get from going on walks or swimming, it's a type of fitness that's specifically related to scent, to using their nose. It's, it's aerobic fitness as well as other types of conditioning. So a lot of people uh, who professionally train uh, uh, detection dogs nowadays actually put, their, put work into conditioning their dogs, into, um, into uh, um, making sure that their dogs are very fit and what they what some of them might do is they might take the dogs for a run or a walk and when the dog is still a little bit winded they put the dog on a scent wall because that forces that dog to uh, you know the, the the bricks the brick wall or even scatter some food on the ground right uh, but the thing is you know food the smallest amount of food that the dog will work for right is probably still too big potentially to make to to gain the maximum gain from this exercise but you have yeah, to go yeah. to exercise first but yeah 100 percent, i would absolutely um encourage everyone to get their dog searching for food uh because it's just fun dogs love it and it makes them use their nose more right regardless of breed um anyway does this answer your question jolene yeah, that's fine. It's just so I've done both methods. So I've done the the wall, brick wall method with um Astrid and the small tiny bits of Kong, 
um but i'm not doing it with my later dogs if that makes sense oh, yeah. i am doing more stuff with just motivation so just constantly searching for things and it doesn't oh, yeah. matter what she's searching for um so i do that a lot but food is just obviously something that we all have so i was just thinking about the people that are on tonight we don't always have the option to go to Astrid and buy a course or whatever, but right. what we can do in the interim is we no. can do some food searches, can't we? We can add that into our everyday life. Yeah, yeah going to, uh, yeah, so you can choose to go to a class. Sniff, I think Sniffer Dog, um, Sniffer Dog UK, they also do small amount of Kong. And there is class. Yeah, UK Sniffer Dog does, yeah. Yeah, I'm just so bad with them. <laughs> Uh, they do a small amount of uh, they 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 do they teach you how to get your dog to search for something that can be made tiny. But of course, you have to have motivation first. So what you're describing, Jolene, is an exercise that's a foundation for any dog uh, to start with. It's I'm talking about dogs who are already very motivated to sniff, but who don't ha who struggle when they can't be running at the same time as sniffing. Does this make sense? So that's yeah. a very particular solution, very, very specific, narrow solution. And yeah, of course, you don't have to do this to make a good dog, to make a good trailing dog or a tracking dog, but it but it helps, okay? So small amount of scent, getting your dog to, and you can reward however your dog likes being rewarded, but, um, and there is many steps towards being able to get your dog to search for tiny amount of scent. And I can't share with you those steps because that's a not even a webinar. That would be a whole course, right? But you can go out and look for opportunities to learn this with your dog if you want. So um, the other thing that uh, you can do instead of uh, doing this uh, Kong searches or tiny amount of uh, scent searches is get your dog uh, into hard surface tracking any form of tracking, but ideally off the grass or not in very succulent um, cov kind of natural ground. If you start teaching your dog to track, and that was uh, for Catherine, I would say for your dog, I would be uh, complementing your trailing journey with, with tracking methods because they get dogs to uh, use their noses more than their legs. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually, you mentioned that. That's what I've started doing with my youngest Springer, who is very, very all Spaniel. She's Spaniel 24-7, and she's chaos personified. Um, and I've, I've, well, exactly what you said, you don't want intensity with her. Like, it's the worst thing in the world because she just overshoots, and she's wild, and she's, like, the biggest problem child then. But tracking is what I've started to do with her, um, and I've seen huge successes already. Like you say, it's that detail and that, value in small pockets in small amounts of scent as opposed to trying to follow this big picture all the time um and i love that you're mentioning so many different things and different ways that we can enhance our spanielness without the chaos involved with said spaniel yeah 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 that's it so um sorry guys a second so uh we we uh hard surface tracking something similar to that is going to to help um one second i just have a, a tiny little um tiny little uh, glitch here Do -do 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 -do. i've lost my notes a second and it should work now. hopefully Okay. Oh dear. Apologies, my darlings. I've done something very stupid just now. And if you bear with me a second, uh, why don't we quickly go through some questions while I'm trying to get my notes back? Yeah, I'll do that. And then um, you can go in the end. Um, you can find your bits and pieces. Uh, Alison says, absolutely. Her Hebe will find the tiniest bit of Kong, which really gets her to focus. 
Um, yeah, that really helped. That's that's good to know. Yeah. Kiara says the advantage of those air bricks against the wall is that it's harder for him to just go Hulk smash and knock <laughs> over the pipe or pot to get the scent article. Yeah. Uh, Natalie says if I'm gardening and throw a snail into the hedge, Percy will return with it a few minutes later, even if I make sure he's not looking where I throw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. that's a propaganda for you, yeah. Uh, Hannah says, yeah, she takes a UK sniffer dog course. It's brilliant. One of my boys absolutely loves scent work, whereas my other boy gets too frustrated as it's not as fast paced activity. Mm. Yeah, 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 it's not. And, and for some dogs, it's too frustrating because they can't be running. But if yeah. you can motivate them for that, then your trailing will improve. Right. I'm still really struggling with... Um, getting my notes back because I've done something accidentally on my lap, on my tablet here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it on a different, uh, in a different place. And, um, and that means, is my camera still working guys? We can still see you. Yes. It's all good. Oh. So apologies for this, just a small disruption. Um, I'm going to get into this thingy. Um, I love how um, Becky just asked a question. So Becky's asked, I am my Springer pulls like a steam train when she's on the trail. Should I tell her to be steady or just let her continue and just be in the lead? Becky, you've done you've done two days of trailing. <laughs> Scion's amazing. Yeah. You just need to get into the pace of it. <laughs> Uh, that is a man trailing addict over on Guernsey, and that's a spaniel addict over on Guernsey. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> Cyan oh, goes like the perfect, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's normal at first that they pull like a train, it gets easier. Do delayed and sent article start, she's totally ready for it. Yeah, it's it, it just at first you have to build motivation. So, so the pulling like a train sounds like your dog is well motivated, and that's a good thing. But uh, once you are sure of the motivation, uh, you can move on to um yeah delayed starts good okay so i've opened my notes on here it just means i'm gonna be not looking at your faces uh the whole time uh and there's not, not so many faces anyway because a lot of you guys are not um on video so um we've got uh the we've got so far look detailed search for a small amount of sand we've got a hard surface tracking as what another or difficult surface tracking as another solution to help dogs uh, uh learn to use their nose without running and then we've got uh in your trailing what you can do is practice all their trails so so uh, send uh delayed start or start from article and uh once your dog is advanced enough you can start practicing all their trails and try to make the person at the end um, not be so smelly, <laughs> which what I mean by this is uh, hide their scent, hide their body scent in a, a body bag or uh, get them into a room, some behind the doors. Try to not uh, allow the person at the end of the trail to create a massive, huge scent picture, which we all do all of the time but we're a lot bigger than even pheasants. And as soon as the dog picks up this, the, the air scent of a person, they uh, switch to uh, getting to that person as quick as possible, right? Uh, following air scent. That's all good and well, but what we're actually trying to develop with Spaniels is the, is the scent that's left on the trail. And for young dogs who are, on, who, who are inexperienced, we don't want the trails to be necessarily extremely long. And when a trail is short and the person at the end of it is also creating a big scent picture and it's an older trail, which means the person has been sitting there for a while, half of the trail could be air scenting. So hide your misper in a body bag or some, or like make them, you know, put something around them. Uh, or put them behind some doors or uh, trap their scent somewhere where the, it's not quite so available to the dog and um, uh, and do slightly older trails. So the, the scent has time to settle a little bit more, right? The, the scent particles can settle a little bit more. That's for experience, for more experienced dogs who already are uh, searching from scent article, okay? Um, that's uh, solutions to 
wanting to run when aroused. Now, frustration, right? Uh, Spaniels can get very frustrated very easily. Here are some solutions for us, right? What we can do to help them build that tolerance to frustration a little bit. One of the things is, um, is whatever training you're doing, try to build the difficulty of, of what you're doing in at the correct pace. That means make it challenging, but not too challenging. So adapt the how uh, you're uh, increasing the difficulty, uh, adapt the progress, the little steps in progress that you're making in such a way that the dog is um, experiencing a tiny, tiny little bit of frustration and overcoming it by thinking and by their actions, right? Um, it's, it's not always easy to do this with trailing because there's so many things on trail that are hard to predict. But uh, one of the things I would be doing is when I'm trying to get the dog to, like I would try to uh, re uh, reduce contamination, for example. It's very hard to do this in man trailing, especially in man training ses group sessions because it's impossible to not have contamination because people are walking everywhere. It's very, very hard. But if we can keep contamination to the minimum, uh, then we are leaving a clear trail that forces the dog to uh, to use their nose, but we're, um, but we're maybe adding some turns in, okay? Some complications. Does this make sense? No, it doesn't clearly because there's it's crickets, silence. <laughs> <laughs> no feedback. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The other thing is, um, I would what I would do with, and I do it with all with many of my clients with spaniels, is my little kind of a go to thing to help everyday spaniels and their owners, is I use shaping, which is a training method as a way of building dogs uh, up and, uh, t and teaching dogs to do a little bit more thinking and a little bit more uh, kind of impulsive, instinctive, reactive behaving, right? So shaping, those of you who are trainers will of course be familiar with what that means. Those of you who are not professional trainers, but maybe amateur uh, um, or uh, enthusiast trainers will also know what that means. And some of you might not have heard what, what this is. So I'm gonna quickly explain. It's a training method. Uh, it's a way in which you can teach a dog something but it's also a very interactive, fun game that you're playing with your dog, right? And this is what it looks like. Again, we, we, we would have to look deeper into it for me to give you some exact examples. But you can go all, uh, away and do some research uh, uh, in clicker training. Usually in training, typically we use a clicker. So it's a small device like this or this, and it makes a sound. I'm going to click now. So if you don't want your dogs to hear, then get them out of the room or a quieter one. It's just a thing that makes a sound. That's all it is. It's a precise, sharp sound, which which um, it's later as we're training becomes associated with, uh, with the reward. And what it does in the brain is once you have trained your dog and, and kind of um, introduced this sound, what it does in the brain is it creates a little dopamine spike so a reward, the reward system is suddenly activated when the dog hears this click, the sound of the click, right? That makes the reward be a very quickly, the pleasure of the, uh, the, the pleasure experience to be very, very uh, precisely associated with the very moment you've clicked. So you click something that Thing, that behavior that the dog was doing in that moment or something about that situation becomes associated with the, dog, the dog's brain with pleasure. Of course, in order for this to work, you have to always follow your click with a reward or almost always, because that's how you maintain that connection. And the reward can be whatever your dog likes, right? So let's say where uh, you want to teach your dog to uh, hand touch or you can teach your dog to pick up a dummy 
and hold it or you want your dog uh, you want to teach your dog to uh, wrap around the cone or do anything or any or, or, or indication for uh, scent detection you can use shaping as this uh, as a method uh, to teach this right um the thing that makes shaping very good for dogs uh, ability to tolerate frustration and to think when aroused is that when they're trying to figure out what will make you click, you don't tell them what makes them click. There might be some hints. There should be some hints in the dog's training area about what might be the solution to their, to answer to their question. What can I do to make mommy click or daddy? Uh, they're going to try to try different things, right? And as they're trying different things, they might get a little frustrated when they can't come up with the right solution very quickly. And Spaniels do get very frustrated very easily with, with that because they just um, they just want their reward fast, right? And uh, when their level of frustration that they're experiencing is just big enough, is, is like a, it's just small enough that they can tolerate it but they come up with the solution if they just think, then they're starting to use thinking as a strategy, right? Rather than running, for example. And they become a, they, they, they develop a habit of when frustrated, when I don't know what to do, when I don't know where the trail is, when I don't know, uh, when I get, when I don't know the answer, and it's hard and I want my reward, instead of throwing my toys out of the pram, I can just think. Instead of switching into this displacement, running and faffing, barking or any other typical spaniel behavior, looking back at mommy and jumping at mommy, uh, I just have to think and, and see if what else I can try. I can try things. What if I do another round? What if I check another... You know, they, they just don't give up so easily on trying different things. Instead of persisting at one particular thing over and over and again, if it doesn't work, they will try something different. This is where shaping can be useful. Uh, if you guys have any other questions about shaping, just let me know. Uh, but other than this, I encourage you to just look it up and look up clicker training. There's loads of materials out there for it. And I use this uh, with my uh, most of my... Um, uh, spaniel owners for all kinds of things, just everyday life coping <laughs> strategies for spaniels. Uh, then we've got uh, building confidence. So another uh, solution to to the to the frustration that the, that spaniels experience is just trying to build their. Uh, this is something we already mentioned. Building the confidence, the spaniel's confidence with trails that are fairly clear. So again, minimal minimal. Um, contamination, maybe not a lot of olfactory noise, but also, um, or if there is a lot of olfactory noise, then maybe the, the, we can use some disturbance. So we can use the, 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 tr we can make the trail very smelly, so to say, um, so that they can, something that they can follow, even though they're aroused. Okay, so before we add difficult conditions, hard surface, like prolonged hard surface, before we add a lot of contamination, we should uh, build, the do build dogs up with fairly clear trails first, ideally. Okay, um, that's this uh, frustration solution. So we've talked so far about dogs wanting to use speed uh, and, and running when aroused as a strategy. Another thing, another problem that Spaniels have is they get easily frustrated. We've talked about solutions to that. Now we're going to talk about their interest in wildlife and how we can help with that. This is tricky because this is so deeply ingrained in Spaniels. We can't train birdies out of spaniels just impossible but what we can do is we can teach them to control themselves because that's what they do in their uh, day job as uh, as hunting retrievers in their job description is they have to be controlled they have to uh, learn uh, to hunt with their person they can't uh, spaniels the on shoots they don't just w w run wild at least they're not supposed to you will get told off by uh, by someone if your dog does 
and um, and they're supposed to be under control. And that includes physical control from you, like having the lead on. It also includes a kind of a voice control. So you telling the dog or whistle control that they must do this and not that, that they must sit, that they must come back or whatever. And also it includes self-control. So the dog knowing, for example, that when they flush the pheasant, we don't uh, try to grab the pheasant. We uh, sit nicely. I'm sorry, my mom is trying to call me now. Um, oh, this is not helping. Right. So they, uh, they, uh, they need to learn to not go where they know all the pheasants are at the end of the field. Do you remember when I talked to you about how spaniels? Oh, sorry, my mom is ringing again. Uh, do you know uh, how we talked about how spaniels, the, the pheasants can hear the beaters coming from like 50 meters or 100 meters? And the pheasants go like, whoops, did you hear the beaters? Shall we leg it? And they all go away from the beaters and they all congregate at the bottom of the field by the hedges, right? Or where the mound is or where, wherever, at the end of that drive. And eventually the beaters and the dogs catch up. But your spaniels, your experienced spaniels will know exactly where all the pheasants are. But instead of running to the very end of the field where they know all the pheasants are already waiting, they have to stay with their handler no more than 10 meters or 15 meters away, right? This is self-control. And gun dog training uh, is, um, you know, dogs trained as gun dogs have, and people who do gun dog training have been working on this for centuries. So there's so much knowledge in gun dog training. Not all the methods are very nice. Uh, this is changing. So bear with us. Uh, gun dog trainers are evolving as well. But uh, currently, um, it's not all um, always very nice to dogs. So uh, good news is uh, nice and kind methods that are a little bit more um, take the actual dog's welfare into consideration a little bit more are developing and are there and I encourage you to explore gun dog training or or kind of gun dog training for pet dogs because you will teach your dog uh, much better control around wildlife right so that's something uh, that's that's another kind of area that you can go to to improve your trailing dog is to teach them a better focus around wildlife and better self-control around wildlife. Another thing you can do is you can, again, from gun dog training, you can go into this, um, you can go and practice hunting with your dog. So um, again, because this is a concept from gun dog training and I'm aware of time, I'm not gonna go deeply into this. Go, uh, go ahead and look up, um, talk to your local gun dog trainer, me drop me a message. I'm super glad and happy to hear from all of you i'll uh, get i'll let you know how to contact me and we can talk more about this idea of hunting together and um and getting your dog to understand that you don't necessarily want them to not ever like birds impossible but that sometimes even though there are birds we're going to do something other than hunting birds Right. So then we've got another thing that you can do to help with wildlife being a distraction or any other scent being a distraction for your spaniel on the trail is to teach your dogs a better scent discrimination. Use non wildlife distractions in your training, be it scent detection or trails to teach your dog what they are supposed to look for and what they're not supposed to look for. Right. So planned um, engineered distractions scent distractions to teach better scent discrimination uh, to help your dog stay on the trail. There's also scent discrimination activities that your instru your man trailing instructors will show you uh, when you're ready. Then uh, finally, um, a, a really important point for wildlife and any distractions on the trail is your reward that you use to reward your dog for for finding the person for completing the trail successfully has to be has to be timely and has to be at the right level if your dog doesn't care about your reward but they enjoy trailing there is not a massive reason for them to stick to the trail you ask them to trail right if they find a more interesting trail they can continue trailing because they love trailing but they would prefer find if they would prefer finding a place where a deer slept um an hour ago then finding your misper 
then you may need to think about your rewards, right? How you can make your reward more interesting. And uh, guys, any comments? I feel like I'm talking a lot. Anything you want to add or ask at this point, Jolene, Catherine? Jolene is uh, resting. Oh. Yeah, it's my phone's going to die, that's all, because I was meant to be on the laptop, not the phone. Uh, let's have a look. So, um, ba -da -ba -da -da. Kate says, shaping definitely helps my youngest dog, Gwen, to think and not um, get frustrated and bark. Shaping and thinking, Alex says, shaping and thinking, Blake will just try all his possible behaviours extremely quickly, getting more and more frustrated and barking. How do we get to the thinking stage? Huh? So answer to this is um, um, you may have to change the whole context of shaping because it might be that by now, when he thinks you're going to be shaping, he might already start getting into this little bit of a frenzied uh, mindset. So I would start by changing the picture or completely with shaping and two, improve your shaping skills so that you get, uh, because shaping is a very advanced skill really training wise. And I continuously try to improve it. And when I have not shaped for a while, I get really rusty. So you need to keep your shaping skills, your timing, how thinly you, you, um, okay, jargon, uh, slice your criteria, how, how tiny the steps are that you're in, uh, uh, how easy is it for the dog to get the right answer is important. And for a dog who gets easily frustrated, it needs to be really easy to get the right answer before we start making it a little bit harder. And this is all about how you set up your session. But I would probably first just change the whole scene because um, dogs quickly can start already getting into this tantrum head just when they see a clicker because they already know they're going to be frustrated and they've already decided they're going to be frustrated and they're already going to start barking so um get someone to look at shaping with you or uh practice a game again i've got all these cool games that i can encourage you to do it's called portal p-o-r-t-l if you have uh, just uh, type it into google and see what it means it's a shaping game for people where you can improve your, your shaping skills. See how niche this is. There is even shaping games for people who are animal trainers so that they can improve their, um, their, their, this particular one method of training. And uh, yeah, work on your, uh, on your shaping skills. Um, yeah. Um, I, I also uh, uh, invite you guys to give, drop me a, um, a line if you uh, would like to have a session with me uh, and look at any of those things, uh, then I would be very happy to support you. Right. Uh, let's. Ha what was there anything else, Jolene? Sorry, there was possibly other. Yeah, Beverly says Purdy has control with pheasant squirrels, but no control with at all with cats. She chased one once nearly across the road and terrified me. I don't have a cat, so no how idea how to resolve this. Okay. Cats are are a little easier, uh, in not in terms of how exciting they are. They are very exciting, but a little bit easier in that taking hold of cat scent is potentially more doable for most of us than getting hold of pheasant scent, for example. So you could um, reach out to your friends and family and um, anyone you can and um, try to get some fairly fresh cat scent. For example, you can give your friend who has a cat uh, some little uh, rug and put it in the place where the cat likes to sleep. And then take that rug or just ask for a bit of bedding from their cat's bed, but it, uh, as fresh as possible. Put it quickly into a container, put that container on your trail, and that's not gonna be a cat, right? There's a big difference between something that smells faintly of a cat you know an hour earlier and uh, an actual live cat but it's a place to start later you can um it's about kind of creatively looking for solutions and finding uh, things you can do around cats could you um train somewhere where cats are 
and train some focus on something like search. I use scent detection for my gun dog, um, for my, uh, when I want my um, dog to be a little bit more level headed around pheasants, what I can do is I can go into an enclosure that has pheasants in it and get my dog to do a search task for Kong and reward my dog for finding the Kong. And it teaches, even though all she wants is to just throw herself at the pheasants and just grab them if she can, what I'm teaching her is I know, I understand that you're excited about the pheasants, but now we're searching for Kong and I'm going to reward you for searching for Kong. And of course, I make the tasks easy and the reward super high at first, but later she becomes better and better and better at focusing around the pheasants. I cannot train her to not like pheasants and you're not going to be able to train your dog not to like chasing cats. Unfortunately, that's now a thing. But what you can do is you can teach her to control herself or himself around cats and also other fast moving objects. So creatively come up with distractions and scenarios that are a little bit like a cat. Smell wise, size wise, movement wise. OK, and and teach any uh, and teach focus on any task to start with around those. And later it can be um, a scent task and later it can be actually training. Yeah. Okay, guys, we have one more uh, thing to look at. Uh, one more disadvantage that Spaniels have that, are, that they can be born with for the work, for the trail work. And that is that they like to use speed to solve problems, speed and power to solve problems. And, and when, especially when aroused or frustrated, and that is not always a good strategy on the trail. So we already talked about using shaping. Um, and other cognitive tasks, so other things where your dog has to think about the solution, even when they're a little bit frustrated, a little bit of frustrated. That's the upper. Uh, that's a. That's the important bit. The caveat is a little bit of frustration. We're thinking of it as inoculation. Think of it as um, a vaccine. Small, tiny amount of frustration that the dog becomes desensitized over time to and is able to think through. Cognitive tasks, especially shaping, will um, skillful shaping will help your dog learn to get better at using other things than running and power and speed to solve problems. Um, another thing, when we're introducing um, Spaniels to, tra to trailing, to man trailing, be careful not to overuse intensity trails, it's, of course, super important at first to build the motivation to find the trailer, uh, to find a misper, and it's important to reintroduce it every now and again to, um, to, um, um, to boost their motivation. And you can use it at the end of the trail as a reward, but make sure you switch your dog to, to delayed and uh, um, start from article as soon as you can, just make the trail easy, right? Uh, then, uh, and um, and the other thing is uh, that we can do is we can um, introduce, once your dog is um, already experienced enough, what you want to do is you want to teach your dog on a trail to, to disregard paths, and tracks and trails because spaniels love living on autopilot they love being in a fast lane if they think they know the solution they're going to stop thinking and they're going to relax their work and very often when we practice trails on paths or on tracks following tracks tracks paths and pathways a lot then dogs just learn a pattern of, okay, the uh, I, if I started on a path or if the trail hits a path, I just follow the path and the path will take me. That's actually for all dogs. I found this as a when I was teaching as an instructor is that dogs often uh, just went like, okay, it's a path. I don't even need to sniff here because sniffing is hard. And if I just follow a path, it will take me to the person, right? You may find that as well, uh, guys, in your training. So teach your dogs to track, to trail, oh, to follow a trail that cuts across paths and goes off paths a lot. Avoid teaching your dogs to stick to paths on trails too much. But of course, you don't want to teach the dogs to avoid paths, but 
try to not accidentally develop the expectation that following a path is a strategy, right? They need to follow their nose, not a visual thing. The same, but we have the same problem in gun dog training. But I'm gonna not go into that rabbit hole because um, it's no need to. <laughs> there's no need to keep you guys here unnecessarily. We're almost done. Um, actually, we are done. This is all my answers for you to this um spaniel conundrum. How to make spaniels better trailers outside of actual man training. That's me. That's me done with my with my lecture, guys. However, breathe. <laughs> yes, I can breathe, but I'm not finished talking to you. There's something I really, really want to tell you about, guys. Um, something I'm so excited about, and it's the first time I'm going to publicly announce this because it's um it's both interesting and exciting, but it's also a project I'm involved with. And the, for especially for those of you with, with Spaniels, I have something just for you that you can do uh, aside from man trailing. Um, it's a new dog sport. It's a new activity. But while it's a new activity, it's it's um, rooted in very old uh, activities that gun dogs have been doing for centuries. The sport is called scurry dog. And it's a gun dog games activity for pet dogs. So it's very accessible, very friendly. You are not required to wear anything made out of tweed. You don't have to walk with a carved stick. You don't have to um, have a four by four. Uh, and you don't have to be, have any interest in, in shooting anything. And you can be vegan or completely uninterested in killing anything and enjoy giving your dog an outlet for doing what they were bred to do. Um, and <clears throat> even if you have no interest in actually shooting, right? So this is a sport uh, that's inspired by Spaniels, but it's actually for all breeds. It's just that I wanted to see, I work with my Spaniel clients and I just wanted to, me and my friend, Claire, both of us uh, who are uh, creating this project, we wanted for uh, for the, our Spaniels and for other dogs we work with and their owners, the lovely owners, to have an activity that's easy to get into. Working tests and um, other field trials and beating is not always easy to get into. It can be a little bit intimidating sometimes. And uh, not everybody has access to it. And we want to create a sport that has access to it, right? Uh, Kira says there isn't, uh, sorry, I've just uh, just spotted this one comment. I uh, probably should just not pick one comment, but uh, yeah. she says there, is, there isn't really any scurry culture in Ireland. It's such a shame, especially because field trials are restricted to KC. Oh, I know this is annoying because some of us have sprockers. I've got a, sp a springer who is not registered and I can't do trials, field trials or uh, sorry, field trials or field uh, these other uh, working tests, other activities. So uh, Kira, this is brilliant because um, this uh, will be available uh, um, well, we're going to start obviously in UK, but the idea is that you can have a go at doing something gun doggy with your dog, any breed, right? And um, work, have some structure to work within and fulfill those talents, right? So the sport is called Scurry Dog. It uh, The name Scurry relates to this fun activity that you will often see at country fairs. Those of you guys who aren't part of already part of some gun dog um, world. Um, if you go to uh, country fairs, you will often see kind of some fun activities for dogs that involve bales of straw and uh, often and often uh, gun dog dummies. And you can take part and have a go. In fact, me and uh, myself and um, Claire are both running some scurries in, in, in Wales, both South and North Wales this summer. So we encourage you guys to come and either help or come and have a go. And we will be uh, organizing a lot of scurry days, just fun scurry days. So activities where you can have uh, have your Spaniel run through some bail, do the things they love, running, jumping, sniffing, and retrieving things, and just let them, let them enjoy that. But all also put some training in. Now, there's five uh, different disciplines in Scurry Dog, and you can do all five disciplines 
or you can focus on one discipline and get really good at that before you move on to another discipline, because there's also multiple levels. There's five disciplines and five levels for each discipline. So it's like a grid and you can have, and so the disciplines are, I'm going to rattle it off my, off the top of my head. The disciplines are one retrieving, of course. So they're all different um, fun and crazy retrieve challenges that will work your dog's brain even more than they work your dog's uh, speed and power, right? Uh, so fetch isn't always about chasing a moving ball. In fact, there's so much to fetch and retrieve that we don't do with our dogs and we could be stretching them mentally, really, really stretching them. Two, hunting. It's a type of scent work exercise, but it's geared towards the type of searching that hunting and beating dogs do and working close to you but in partnership with you right uh, then we've got um um everyday dog everyday dog is is basically everyday fun obedience challenges uh, that include healing that include stays but with really fun distractions so, th so it's not about style. It's not about sexy heel work, although you can train sexy heel work if you want. It's more about a simple basic skill being so bomb proof that your dog can do it no matter what you throw at them. So your dog will be healing past, you know, um, somebody kicking a ball, a uh, football, maybe, uh, maybe uh, uh, recalling back to you past some really interesting smelly things. Maybe, um, um, there is actually so many fun challenges that I, you know, we're trialing currently. And some of you, some of you guys here would have been to one of the events that I've done and seen uh, some of the silly distractions we come up with. Was it one, uh, Jolene, you were at that we had, you, you had to park your dog in a sit and, uh, and hang up socks on a line? Yeah, so I think from memory, we had to park our dog in a sit and pick up a fake poo. Yep, and put it in a, in a bin, yep. And put it in the bag, yeah, while the dog sat there. We had to park her in a sit while I put washing on the line. Yes. And then we had to do heel work or recall past one of those barking toy dogs, I think. Or oh, something. yeah. No, you had to rescue one. You had to go past it, but then you had to pick it up and put it in a in a box. In a basket or something. In a basket, because it, uh, it was a lost puppy who needed rescue yeah. or bunny. You also had to walk, heal your dog past those uh, pigeon decoys. Yeah. Remember? Yeah, so just silly, uh, just obedience, but with a twist. It's functional, useful stuff that you want your dogs to know, but it's about making your dogs bomb-proof, not about style and precision, right? Uh, and it so was fun and light-hearted as well, so it was really enjoyable. Yeah. Not fun, yeah. Uh, that's right. It's, it's fun, and it's about you having a, a laugh and going home and doing a little bit more training to get even better not about uh you know it's not about competition as such it is it, there's going to be one small element of competition but in this sport it's more about you um gaining your badges and points more than uh, competing against others okay uh there is two more disciplines one of them is called i don't know what we're going to call it yet we're deliberating uh, so i don't i'm not going to tell you the name of it yet uh but the but it's this little trail do you remember i talked to you about the kind of trails that spaniels will do so a pheasant falls it gets up and then runs away leaving a little scent trail that that dog then has to pick up and follow and find that hidden pheasant. Yes, do you remember that? That's the kind of activity that is, uh, we're gonna reproduce it, that activity. So a small, short, hot trail, not hot trail as in fresh trail, that's going to be laid by something other than a human. Uh, don't worry, it will not mess up your man trailing. We, we are very conscious of the fact that our lovely people who are gonna be taking part are also partake in other sports and we don't want to interfere. So you can have a gun dog that you train for actual gun work, or you can have a dog that you trail with or do send detection with. And we will, uh, we're arranging our um, uh, challenges in such a way that you can keep these things separate. And, fi and finally, uh, really one that I'm really excited about <clears throat> is um, where you can teach your dog to away from you, listen and take directions and go in different, um, go where you send them from a distance. 
And that might include sending them across some task places, right? Of course, we will show you exactly how to train it, uh, but it's a very, very cool skill that you can develop with your dog, where your dog is 10 meters away from you and goes where you're sending them, taking turns and going over things and under things and doing little tasks away from you. So that's five different disciplines in a uh, scurry dog. Now, those of you guys who are who might be interested in knowing more because we're developing it and it's we're almost ready to publish uh, uh, our website and to share with you this uh, fabulous new activity. It's not quite ready yet. And if you want to know more and you want to know when we're ready, then you can drop your name on an email list i'm going to drop that in the comment and i'm going to share with you um share screen and i'm going to share with you my very messy um uh desktop and uh okay so where are we no where is the part oh there uh, so here is no that's not it here no, that's not it either. <laughs> right. The uh, thing I want to share with you is um, copy link. The thing I want to share with you, I don't, don't actually have to share my screen for this. I'm going to put this in the comments. Oh, wait, no, that's too clear. I want to uh, everyone. Uh, I'm going to, in the comments, uh, post a link. If you click on this, you should be added to our email list so that you know what's happening when we have our first events, any courses, when we have our website, we can let you know. Also, the other thing is we're going to need people all around UK to help with event, to help out with events. So those of you who are trainers and are interested in potentially teaching uh, gun dog training and scurry dog to your, to your Spaniel client, or those of you who want to um, get the perks of being volunteers at our events, because we will need vol volunteers, you can um, let us know. Uh, and you can just be on that um, email list because we're gonna be asking for helpers. Um, over the next uh, couple of years, uh, all around uh, UK and later also abroad. And Kira, uh, you know, we hopefully will go out to you as well. Where uh, where in Ireland are you, by the way? Sorry, I'm, I have a special place in my heart for Ireland. So, um, uh, so uh, Kira says, I think Hannah and I are offering to be part of your uh, Irish outpost class in Dublin. Fantastic. Fantastic. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so this is guys, uh, this is the bit about scurry dog. And I just wanted to also let you know how you can get in touch with me. So uh, this is my logo. So you can easily recognize it when you come, when you look, because there is a something else that's called uh, um, Synchro Dogs. I'm not Synchro Dogs, I'm Synchro Dog. I'm gonna share my uh, page with you. Synchro Dogs are kind of a, a artist, a pair of artists, and I think they do a lot of nude photography and that's not my page. So if you go on their page, uh, that's uh, you're gonna find something not, that doesn't look anything like um, what we're doing. So here is what my Facebook page looks like. Uh, so you can find me easily on Facebook. That's kind of where I hang out the most and drop me a message there about anything, any questions, or if you want a little bit of help with your training, or if you want to know more about um, any of that we spoke about, you can also find me on Instagram. That's just loading. I'm also on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok. Uh, it's maybe it's the newest, my newest place to be on. So I'm not there as much. And also, this is my page. It's not a really well, good looking page uh, yet, but currently it just is uh, functional. And I have some courses on there, both online and in person. So um, there's uh, this is also where you can sign up to hear from me personally about uh, Scurry Dog. Uh, either drop me a message that you want to be on the list or follow that link that I posted earlier. Well, I'll also post that link in the group, in the Spaniel, in the Man Training Spaniels group, okay? I'm sure Jolene and Catherine won't mind. Right, I can shut up now. <laughs> cool, thank you so much for tonight. I know that we have run um, quite far over um, time and things like that, but it's been really interesting and really fascinating to try and delve <laughs> deeper into it. Um, have we got time for questions or shall we get people to message you? 
can't see there's anything else that was massively popping out at me. One person asked, are Spaniels able to distinguish um, multiple sports like tracking, trailing and scent detection easily? Or uh, Say that again, the beginning of that question again. One person asked, can Spaniels um, differentiate between different sports like tracking, trailing and say scent detection? easily or are they a breed that's potentially going to struggle no it's a it's all about setting the context and uh, it's it's up to us to keep it separate to keep the things we want to keep separate separate so for example if i wanted to have a dog who is a tracking dog and also a man trailing dog and i would i wanted to the, the dog to work differently depending on which context they're in depending on whether they're, they're tracking or trailing then i would make it I in my training I would make sure that I make these two activities as different as possible I would add different cues I would be using different harness I would be using maybe my clothing would be different I probably would be working in different places maybe with different people I would try to teach those things separately and keep them as separate as possible if that makes sense. So to give you an example, can dogs differentiate, can spaniels differentiate? Absolutely. Raven, when she searches for Kong or when she finds Kong, she will sit and stare. This is her indication. This is the way she lets me know she's found Kong, the red rubber. While if she's searching for a pheasant or when she's searching for a dummy, for example, a little maybe a gun dog dummy like this or this, she knows when she comes, when she's searching for that, that she needs to pick it up and bring it to me. Very different, very different um, way of dealing with the find. And also the style will be different. The search style will be different. Because typically when I get Raven, my cocker, to search for Kong, I task her to a small area. And she understands that she needs to do a lot of sniffing and not a lot of running. Whereas if I send her for a, dummy this size this big smelly thing then she is going to be doing a lot of running in order to cover a lot of ground so yes they can differentiate but it's up to you as a trainer to uh to 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 keep it separate for them to teach them perfect any more questions guys uh, or any questions that we haven't talked about so far yeah, I'm just waiting to see if it comes up with chat. Catherine, have you spotted anything that I possibly haven't? Um, not at the moment. What I'd probably say to people is if you have got any questions after this, is either pop them in the comments on when this uploads to YouTube or um just email Alex. Um she it'd be easier to send the questions to her. <laughs> um I'm sure she'll have a bit of time at some point to reply. Um, but no, I think we covered everything as we went. Yes, I'm just going through some comments really quickly if I can. Um, uh, I'm very sorry if I missed some comments, guys. Uh, Making just sure about best harness for man training with a cocker. Um, this isn't really the place of discussion about that. It's you need to have a chat with your instructor and find the best thing that works for your dog because harnesses are very, very specific to each dog. Um, so it's definitely worth speaking to your instructor about trying a few different ones rather than. Um, trying to us to try and guess what your cocker looks like. Yes, uh, that's true. The other one is uh, Natalie was asking if there's, a, you know, how to find a higher reward than flushing and chasing a pheasant. It's, this is a very interesting question. It's a question that co that crops up in any sport, um, and the the answer is sometimes it's not about. Sometimes you can't find a better reward than this. Sometimes this is the top reward. But what you need to teach your dog is in order to access that reward, they first have to do something for you. Um, or if you if chasing and flushing is not at all um, um, an option, uh, even to use as a reward, then you may have to teach your dog uh, to not do those things, even though they want to even when the opportunities are there. It's tricky. You want to be using rewards that are that are the highest you can when you're working in those situations, especially with an inexperienced dog. Um, 
right? In Gundog training, thankfully, flushing pheasants is something we want them to do. We don't want them to grab the pheasants. So in order, for example, to teach my little cocker who put so much energy into, into flushing that pheasant and the, and she really doesn't see why she shouldn't be catching it. She wants to launch herself in the air like a crocodile out of water with open jaws and snap on that pheasant. She might be thinking, why do I have to sit after I put that bird up if I could just <laughs> easily catch it? And the answer is, the, uh, the solution is a little complex. It's not very simple. It's not necessarily about finding the best reward. It's more about teaching um almost reflexive sit to flush this is an exercise from gundog training sit to flush so uh, changing the 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 thing that she does um and interrupting that chain that instinctive chain of a, a chase and then a grab right and i want to interrupt that grab bit because i don't want my cocker to try to catch the bird because that kicks me out of the trial out of the field trial, uh, right? So we train this by uh, inserting a different behavior in there and teaching it really, really well. So sometimes it's not about finding the best reward. Sometimes the, the answer is more complicated. And sometimes you can um, uh, emphasize a particular reward to a point where it becomes so uh, frequently, so liked by the dog and so frequently practiced that it has a chance of um, competing at least a little bit. I know this is not, maybe not a simple answer, but I don't really want to go deep into this again because I get excited and you guys start yawning and then that's not good. Um, Message Alex is probably all we would say. Message you. Yeah. So you can discuss it further and you could potentially like Alex has got loads of like little games and stuff that you can play online and things like that. So those really help as well. So um that's always an option there. Yeah. So if we've got any more your question or your comment, there's actually quite a few here that I see that we missed. I'm very sorry. Uh, we're going to just just go uh, come to me and ask me personally. I I'd love to chat to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for your thank time. You Thanks, guys, for having me here. And thank you, everybody, for coming and listening to me ramble on about my favorite topic. It was brilliant. Thank you. I'm glad to hear, Natalie. <laughs> All right, guys. Take care, my lovelies. Thank you so much again. We'll put the recording up as soon as we can. So if anyone sort of couldn't miss all of it or want to look over it again, just to look at those pointers, they can do. That'll be in the Mantrailing Spaniels group as soon as we can. Like we said, thank you so much to Alex from Synchro Dog Training. Don't get that wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully if there's any feedback and stuff or any questions, like I said, drop it to Alex or ask us and stuff like that. But yeah, it was definitely a good and interesting topic tonight and so much for us to think about and to actually break down that it's not just always about man trailing with the Spaniels. Yeah. Thank you. It was brilliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, guys. Take care. Go and enjoy your Spaniels and be more Spaniel, don't forget. Be more Spaniel. <laughs> thank you.